Well, I can remember when I was Carter, who was in this video, when I was about his age, and I had a favorite TV show. Um, you have to understand, back when I was growing up, we didn't have Blu-ray, DVD. We didn't have any, even have VHS tapes at that point. And so we had to just watch our show when it actually came on. I know, crazy. Isn't that crazy to think about? You had to watch the show at the time that they had scheduled it to come on. And so I would get up early before my parents on Saturday morning. I don't know how I did it because I didn't have an alarm clock or anything, but I had in my head, I knew I had to get up to watch my favorite TV show because Saturday mornings were Saturday cartoons. Yes, you remember that? Saturday cartoons. And here's my favorite show, Super Friends. I loved that show. Oh, my goodness, loved it. And I would get up and watch that show, and then that show would fuel my imagination for the entire week. I would put on my Superman underoos. Do you remember underoos? Yeah, we, we didn't have costumes. We had underwear and T-shirts that looked like Superman. That's all we had back then. And so I put on my Superman underoos, and I would, Mom would tie a blanket around my neck, and I would run around all week. As long as she would let me stay in my underwear, I would run around playing Superman. And I wasn't alone because I had an imaginary girlfriend, Wonder Woman, <laughs> Linda Carter. Every guy my age had a crush on her at that time. And so Linda Carter and I would fly around our house saving the day. It was, we were awesome. We were. We were awesome. And now I'm an adult, and guess what? I'm wearing my Superman T-shirt because they're bringing super friends to life on the big screen. The Justice League is coming. Aren't you glad you came today to find that out? The Justice League is coming. And anybody, let's see who my friends are. Anybody know when, that, when the opening night is for that? Anybody know? Okay, good. My friends are on the first service. So, All right, I won't worry about you all then, but I will be at the movie theater on November 17th. That's when it's opening. I told the first group, because that's the ones who apparently go to it, I told them I heard that there is a group of men that get together and watch an opening night of movies like that, and it's going to be awkward if you don't invite me and you see me sitting there. So <laughs> let's make sure that that happens. I can't play softball with you, but I can go and see the Justice League. And I was thinking about this. I'm thinking, you know, every generation has its own superheroes. Back even before DC and Marvel Comics came out, American folklore had its superheroes. Paul Bunyan, Pecos Bill. Those are the superheroes of the day that people imagine. And you think even further back, I, I think you could argue that the Greco-Roman mythological gods were people's dreaming up superheroes for the day. And why do we do that? Why does every generation have its own superhero? I would suggest that maybe it's because deep down we all know there are things that should not be that we wish could be different. And so superheroes give us this way to imagine, this way to dream together of what it would be like if things that aren't as they should be would be made like they should be through somebody who has the power to do that. Because we all know there are some things that just shouldn't be. You sit in there, and some of them you can laugh at, and some of them you can look back on and laugh at and say, well, that's not how it should be. You know, I remember when Kimberly um, was going to give birth to our second child, to Seth, she decided that she wanted to go all natural. No epidural, no drugs, nothing. She was going to, and I didn't make her do this. This wasn't, something, this wasn't my idea. This is what she wanted to do. There's lots of health benefits, she felt like, and economic benefit. There's all kinds of things that went into it. She'll tell you the whole story. I get to just tell the part of the stories that I like. So you talk to Kimberly if you want to know the whole stories. I'll tell you the parts that are good. And so Kimberly decided that she just wanted to have a natural childbirth. And I remember us being in the hospital, and you know, all those little videos they show you, and all the things they do to prepare you, don't prepare, because when Anna was born, she had an epidural, and this was a completely different experience than what I was about to experience. And I remember that when she would have contractions, she would stand up. She didn't stand in the bed. She would stand up, and she doesn't, she's not one to let out screams or anything. She's very quiet in that way, and she didn't let any scream, but she would say, Chad, stand there. And then she would grab my arms, and she would do this all the way through the contraction, and the whole time I was going, <laughs> and I had no idea the strength that she had. And then the nurse came in and she said, Kimberly, you are about at the point of no return. If you don't take an epidural now, you can't ask for one later. I'm like, Kimberly, take an epidural. And Kimberly's like, I'm going natural. And I said to the nurse, give me something because I don't want to do this. Like, why are you putting me in this room with her? I can't help her. I don't know what to do. And so she would, Ugh. 
her. And I was, oh, my gosh. I mean, it was hours of this, of her, uh, I mean, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? And at one point, she hit the climax of her contractions, and it was a long one. It was a bad one because she actually let out a scream. She let out a scream, and I thought, oh, gosh, this is going to be bad. And then she went, uh, and then she didn't stop at my wrist. She went on down, and she grabbed my legs, and she started doing this. And I had sweatpants on. And she did. She pulled them down around my knees. And the nurse at that time walks in because she heard Kimberly scream, and she hadn't heard Kimberly scream. And she looks at me and just shakes her head. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're having a moment here. Good night. She looked at me like, you disgust me. I'm like, and I told her, I said, this isn't pleasant for any of us right now. I actually said that. I said, this is not pleasant. I told you to give her drugs. But that's not how it's supposed to be. You read Genesis 3 and 4, and you will find out the Bible said you, weren't, you ladies weren't supposed to have that kind of pain in childbirth. If not for the fall of Adam and Eve, you wouldn't have had to go through that, you know? That's not how it should be. And some of it we can laugh at like that, or at least look back on and laugh at. But there's other things in life that we look at and say, that's not how it should be that you can't laugh at. I remember the Christmas before last, it was actually the day after Christmas, we're in the car with my mom and dad and the kids, and we're all riding someplace together, spending some time together after the holiday. And dad gets a call from work. My dad is a very loyal person, and so he worked at the same company for 35 years. He was the first employee they hired for this security uh, company that was started up in Dayton, Ohio. I, I remember that there were times when mom and dad would explain in our childhood that they were going to be having to cut back because dad had taken a voluntary pay cuts over the years to help the company get through. And that year of that Christmas, when we were in the car with him, dad had made more for the company through sales than all the salesmen combined, and dad wasn't a salesman. He was a project manager. So he was doing well for the company. And at 35 years of service, they called him the day after Christmas and said, Rick, we're not going to need you to come back in. The new CEO is restructuring, and you're not a part of the new plan. We're sorry. We'll have, your box, we'll have your things packed in a box. You can pick it up when you get back from the holiday. And I thought to myself, now that is not how it should be. That's not how one should retire. That is not how somebody who served in a place for 35 years should be told they're going to have to retire. Does that make sense? There are things that happen that we just shake our head at and say, I don't, un that is not how it should be. Earlier this year, I received a phone call from a friend of mine. I saw on my cell phone, it said, Donnie. Donnie and I became friends uh, my freshman year of college. And we stayed friends through college, but then we, our friendship grew even more and became even more meaningful to us after college. Guy was that guy. He lived in Florida. I lived in Ohio, so we didn't get to see each other much, but we talked regularly, and, and it was like he knew when I was going through something that he would give me a call, and I, he didn't even know, but he knew, and I would do the same thing for him, and we'd laugh a lot. It was just a good friend. So I answered the phone, Donnie, how you doing? And it wasn't Donnie. It was his sister, Dina. And Dina's voice was trembling. I said, Dina, what is wrong? She said, Chad, we found Donnie dead this week in his house. I said, what? I just talked to Donnie on my birthday a few weeks ago. And she, she said, yeah, I know. He, um, the, the autopsy revealed he was eaten up with cancer. And as far as we know, he didn't know. And we certainly didn't know. The coroner said he probably just fell asleep and didn't wake up. And I thought to myself, that's not how the end of his story should have gone at 41 years old. But for anybody at that, you know, that is, there's just some things that you go through. There's some things that we experience. There's some situations that we watch those we care about go through that we think that is just not how it should be. But all of our questions of why, how could that happen? If God's a loving God, why does he let it happen? All those questions don't seem to really have a good answer when we're going through it. And so as adults, we put our Superman capes aside and we say, hey, it is what it is. You ever said that? I have. Uh, there's a certain, certain situation, certain relationships, certain problems, and the only thing you can say is it is what it is because you can't explain it. You can't really understand it. It's out of your control to try to change it. And so the best you can do is just say, you know, it is what it is. And, and I think we all have our own situations, our own stories. If we went around the room, we'd all have our own stories of 
the best I can do is say it is what it is because it's nothing's going to change it. It is what it is. And maybe that's why every generation creates their own superheroes. Superman has a strength. Hulk has his rage. Flash has his speed. They all have their own superpower to fix what is not, even though we know it should be. But what if, now just stick with me for a minute, what if that ability for us to dream up this need for a superhero to make things right again actually was put in us by God? Not just so that we can dream up some crazy superhero and be entertained, but what if that longing, what if that desire, what if that in us that says, this isn't how it should be, and I want us to imagine something different, is actually been placed in us generation after generation after generation, direct, dist- misdirected as it may be, to get us to believe again that maybe it is what it is doesn't always have to be. What if? Think of the people of God, the people of Israel. For 400 years, they were enslaved in Egypt. 400 years. I mean, it didn't start out that way. When they first went to Egypt, they went there because Joseph had been put in a position of of, uh, prominence because he had saved Egypt from famine, and now all of his family gets to move in, and they're welcome. They're all, we're so glad to have you because you have saved us. You've saved us. But then within 30 years, memory is short-term, isn't it? Within 30 years, the new pharaohs have begun to forget about Joseph. They begin to forget about the story. And for 400 years, God God's people were enslaved, told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, how to work, how to work harder. They were just enslaved, oppression for 400 years. Every generation's being raised up and said, we didn't used to be slaves. Kids, it is what it is. Until Exodus chapter 15. We're going to start our our series today at the end of the story, and then we're going to go back and see how they got there. But Exodus 15 shows us where it all climaxes. It shows us where God comes through in a huge way. It shows us where the people of God began to understand that they didn't have to keep living by the chant, it is what it is, it is what it is, but God had a new song for them. Let me read it to you, Exodus 15. Hear Moses' song. I'm singing my heart out to God. What a victory. He pitched horse and rider into the sea. God is my strength. God is my song. And yes, God is my salvation. This is the kind of God I have and I'm telling the world. This is the God of my Father. I'm spreading the news far and wide. God is a fighter, pure God through and through. Pharaoh's chariots and army he dumped into the sea. The elite of his officers he drowned in the Red Sea. Wild oceans, waters poured over them. They sank like a rock in the deep blue sea. Your strong right hand, God, shimmers with power. Your strong right hand shatters the enemy. In your mighty majesty, you smash your upstart enemies. You let loose your hot anger and burn them to a crisp. At a blast from your nostrils, the waters piled up, tumbling streams dammed up, wild oceans curled into a swamp. The enemy spoke, I'll pursue, I'll hunt them down, I'll divide up the plunder, I'll glut myself on them, I'll pull out my sword, my fist will send them reeling. You blew with all your might and the sea covered them. They sank like a lead weight in majestic waters. Who compares with you among the gods, O God? Who compares with you in power, in holy majesty, in awesome praises, wonder-working God? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them up, but the people you redeemed led in merciful love. You guided them under your protection to your holy pasture. And as Moses begins to sing that song, you can almost hear the chains of it is what it is falling off of them. As the people of God begin to sing again, as they begin to feel again, as they begin to believe again, as they begin to hope again, as they begin to understand that it's possible to risk loving again and believing again, and the chains are falling off, and as their chains of it is what it is is falling off, God asks us the question, will you hold on to it is what it is, thinking and living, or you dare to embrace who God is? That was the question. That was the difference. This is how they moved from where they were for 400 years of it is what it is slavery into a new land, into new possibilities, into new hope, into freedom. It was all came down to this question. Were they going to hold on to it is what it is because that's all they've known for 400 years or were they going to embrace who God is? Now it's our question. 
What about you? Are you going to hold on to it is what it is? Or do we dare to embrace who God is? Moses says, God is my strength. God is my salvation. God is our fighter. God, His right arm shimmers in power. Who compares to our God? Moses is saying, listen, when you were living, it is what it is living over here in slavery. You couldn't embrace God in all of his power. Moses says, don't miss his power. Sing it loud. Sing it strong. He is your salvation. Sing it for yourself. And he says the same thing to us. Will we hold on to it is what it is, or will we embrace who God is? To be honest, it, it gets harder as an adult. No wonder Jesus said that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to have faith of that of a child. Because when I hear my kids pray sometimes, I'm like, they blow me away with their faith. They just pray something. They believe God's going to do it. But we've lived in the it is what it is, haven't we? And so it gets harder. It's like the one little boy who was at a park reading his Bible on an app. And he was reading. It was the first time ever he had ever read about God parting the sea for the Israelites. And as he read it out loud, he began to say, wow, that's amazing. God, you are so awesome. That's so cool. God, I can't believe you did that. And he was just saying that out loud, forgetting that anybody would hear him. And an elderly man came up to him and said, what are you reading? He said, well, I'm reading the Bible, and I'm reading about this time that God parted the sea. Did you ever hear the story, he asked the man, when God parted the sea and the people walked across on dry ground? The man said, oh, no. And he sat down on the bench next to the boy. He said, oh, no, no. Scientists have proven that God didn't part the sea. They just happened to find a shallow spot for the 18 miles walk across the Red Sea. And they found that shallow spot. And everybody knows that, yeah, Moses, will give him credit for that. He was able to find the shallow spot. But, but that's, God didn't do that. And the boy said, oh, I didn't know that. He said, well, maybe you ought to read more than the Bible so you can know the whole story. The boy said, okay. And he went back to reading. A few seconds later, the boy starts again. Wow. God, you're amazing. God, you're even more powerful than I thought you were. How did you do that, God? That's incredible. And the old man said, what are you saying? Didn't I just tell you that scientists have proved that they walked across on just a few inches of water? And the boy said, I know. That's what's so amazing. God drowned a whole Egyptian army in just a couple inches of water. Wow, God. (laughs) Right? Isn't that like a kid? Isn't that their faith? They're just able to, you say, hey, God can do it. They're like, yep, I know he can. Let's pray. Let's believe. Let's anticipate. Let's expect. But then we go up as adults and we start taking the hand of it is what it is. And it gets us through a few hard things. And we think we can't let go of it anymore. I've been there. A few years ago, I won't spare you of all the details. But basically, I got to a point of depression. It was dark. And there were things that were happening outside of my control. And I was really questioning whether or not I should still be in ministry. And I remember it is what it is, so to speak. Taking my hand and saying, you know what, this is what's going to get me through. I mean, I can't change these things. I can't control them. I've just got to accept them. So it is what it is. And that became my chant. It is what it is. You know, it is. Hey, how's it going? Well, it is what it is. I mean, what are you going to do about all this? I can't do anything. So it is what it is. And, and, I, and, and I held on to that because it is what it is had made a promise to me that if I would accept things as they are, even though they shouldn't be, then it would get me through them and I would get to the other side. But you know, what I found out it is what it is isn't a friend. It is what it is is the enemy coming in the disguise of a friend who's telling us a lie. Because it is what it is doesn't get us through anything. It is what it is doesn't plan to ever get you through anything. It intends to leave you stuck like slaves in chains right where you are. It is what it is says, I'm going to, don't tell them, but they're going to stay in their bitterness if I have anything. They're going to stay in the pain. They're going to stay in that loss. They're going to get stuck in that grief. They're going to stay right here in the chains of this disappointment. They're never going to get free. That's why Exodus 15 means so much to me because God comes along in all kinds of ways, through all kinds of places in the Scripture, through all kinds of people in His body to come to us and say, hey, are you going to hold on to the hand of it is what it is or are you going to embrace who God is in all of His power? Jesus says that if you have faith as small as a mountain seed, you can, a mountain mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move, right? You have any mountains in your life that need to move? 
It is what it is once you just don't, it says, wants you to do this. It brings you up to the mountain, and it is what it is. says, well, it is what it is. Make your home here. Live here. Go, seriously, get your stuff. This is where you're going to live from now on. You might as well just resign yourself, just settle in, because that mountain is too big. There's no way to get around it. You can't climb over it. It, can't, there's nothing. it is what it is. Welcome home. And Jesus comes up to that same mountain to you, his child, his follower, and he says, listen, that is a liar who wants you stuck at the foot of a mountain that I can move. Because if Jesus can be raised from the dead, friends, there's nothing he can't do for you. His power is available. He can move us past these things. A few weeks ago, when I, when I first started here, actually it was during the interview, one of the guardians, our board, shared that in the past you all have had a, a dream of starting satellite campuses. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And, I said, and they said, but, you know, it cost $80,000 was the projected budget for that. And um, when I checked the budget, I found out we don't have $80,000 just lying around. I know that will surprise you because, you know, I mean, that's the only thing churches want is your money. And so you would think we'd have it stockpiled, you know, but it, that's not the case apparently here. And so uh, I thought, well, that's, that's a neat dream and didn't think much about it. Then I got here and it came to mind again because I had been praying about, you know, God, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear things that I need to see and hear. Um, let me have your agenda and not, you know, know the difference between yours and mine. And so just started praying about that and that came to mind. And I thought, huh, you know what? I never followed up on that. I don't know anything more than it cost $80,000. So I asked the staff and they said, well, actually, what it was, how I was going to start was through a virtual campus concept where you would live stream the services out of, in a 20-mile radius and then you would start looking for people who start attending that regularly and you would have a, mon uh, a moderator, a pastor online that would interact with them and start building relationship and then eventually our goal would be to start small groups and wherever there, we find pockets of people watching. And I thought, oh my goodness, well, the church that I was serving in previous to here, they had already done that. They did that this past year and, and they're half our size and they certainly didn't have a budget of $80,000. I mean, I won't even tell you what they did it on because you'd be like, what? That's crazy. You can't do that. Well, really, they couldn't, and probably they shouldn't have, but it's working. And they saw 54 people a week in the last few months start attending, and then they started seeing people accept Jesus, and they started showing baptism videos of these people that they'd never seen before, and they started helping people like a woman who's a shut-in form a small group in her community, and now not only does she have Jesus, but she also has people in her life where she was felt completely isolated, all because they started live-streaming this thing. And so I thought, you know, God, are you telling me that? I'm like, God, we don't have $80,000. That's our mountain. We don't have that. And so I went to Austin, and I said, Austin, man, I think we ought to figure out a way to make this happen. And I said, but we don't have $80,000. And so Austin said, let me look into it. And I went and told the guardians and, and, and talked to them about that, about how why, I think we ought to do this. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we got to do this. And Austin came back and said, Chad, I think now a few years later, technology has cheapened in this way for the things we need. I think we could do it for $15,000 instead of $80,000. I'm like, well, hallelujah. I mean, there's a chunk of that mountain just moved. I can start to see the other side all of a sudden. I still don't have $15,000 laying around, but that's, a, you know, that's still a big mountain for my world, but Lord, that's awesome. God, you're doing it. Well, then come to find out one of the guardians ended up letting people know that we were actually talking about this. I thought this was a personal conversation. I didn't know they were going to tell people, and, but thank God they did because my faith would have held us back. And so they started telling people, hey, we're talking about the virtual campus thing and seeing where that could go again. And then that next Sunday, I think it was my third Sunday here, a lady walks up to me and she says, Chad, one of the guardians told me about this virtual campus thing. I had heard us talking about it in the past. I really want to see God do that. I want to see who we can reach that we might not reach otherwise. I said, yeah. And she said, well, I give regularly. I'm not going to stop doing that. Because frankly, if she had stopped giving that to give to that, it wouldn't have helped us at all. But what she said is, I want to give some money above and beyond. I said, okay. I said, that's awesome. Thank you. That'll give us some money to get started. I had no idea that she was going to hand me a check for $10,000. I think we can celebrate that, friends. Yeah. And then the next Sunday, I had some friends who lived.
from a live um, in Northeast Ohio who showed up just to encourage us here, and they said, we want to give something to something you guys want to see started but hasn't gotten started yet. I said, well, you know, we're doing this virtual campus, playing the whole thing, and they're like, we'll give to that. And they wrote a check for $500. And friends, all of a sudden, you see, God was showing me. God was reminding me as your pastor, Chad, are you going to be the pastor who teaches people to hold the hand of it is what it is, and we walk around saying, well, it is what it is. It is what it is. Well, we don't have the money. We don't have the money. We can't do that. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do what God... Are you going to be the pastor who says, you know what? Jesus said, if there's a mountain standing in front of you, then you stand on that mountain and you have the faith to say, Jesus, you said you can move this thing, and I don't know how you're going to do it, and I don't know when you're going to do it, but Jesus, I believe you can still move mountains. Does anybody else still believe he can move mountains? And here's the good news. He, does, he wants to move mountains a whole lot more important than what I've just been talking about for you. He wants to move mountains for marriages that feel like they're never going to make it. And there's people in here I've already learned that could tell the story of how God moved that mountain. He wants to move mountains of addictions that we think we'll never be free of. He wants to move mountains of fears that have been holding us back for years. He wants to move mountains in our community that people who are going hungry here in the United States, right here in Maysville, Kentucky, wouldn't have to go hungry anymore. He wants to move mountains in such a way that they know that they don't just have food in a box, but there's a people in a church who's willing to leave that church and show them that we care. He wants to move mountains that we haven't even known about, that we don't even know to pray about yet. And you say, well, I don't have the faith like other people have. Here's the good news. Jesus said, you don't need much. You just need faith as small as a mustard seed. This is not, we're not talking about the graduate level stuff. We're talking about the baby stuff. And Jesus says, trust me, that's all I'm looking for from you. And I can move mountains. Will we hold on to it is what it is, or will we embrace who God is in all his power? I was thinking about this. What makes it hard sometimes for us to embrace God in all of his power? And I wonder if it has to do with what's mentioned in verse 12. Let me read it again. It says, you stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them up with the people you redeemed you led in merciful love. You guided them under your protection to your holy pasture. Sometimes I think that maybe the reason I, the ways and other people, struggle to embrace God and all of his power and to believe that he can move mountains is because we haven't embraced, or maybe a better way to put it is, we haven't let God embrace us in his love. I think there's a lot of people who come to church every Sunday that thank God, think that they think that God loves them because he has to. I mean, that's what he does. But not because he wants to. Do you know that God wants and does love you? And there is nothing more or less that you could do to change how he feels about you. And what greater, what greater example did he give us than his own son, suffering and bleeding and a dying on a cross. I mean, if that isn't enough, if that, if that picture, if his own son being sacrificed for my sake, for your sake, isn't enough, then I don't know what else he can do to show you how much his love is other than take what you've seen and heard for all your life, perhaps, or maybe for the first time today that Jesus died for you and take that and make it personal in your daily life. And that is what our God does. He takes this big picture of his love and he translates it down into your personal life to show you how he loves you. But will we hold on to it is what it is, or will we embrace God and who he is, his power, his love? So well, how do we do that? Well, here's how the people of Egypt did it, the people of, in Egyptian slavery. They packed their bags, and they left Egypt. Think about that. The only reason, the only ones who got to see God part the sea and then walk across on dry ground, the only ones who got to see that were who? The people who said, okay, 400 years, it is what it is. I'm scared to death. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'm willing to trust and see if this God is who Moses says he is. 
And so they packed their bags and they left. Anybody who didn't, anybody who stayed behind, they didn't get to see God's power. They didn't get to experience for themselves God's love. But every one of them, and we think it could be around 600,000 men plus women and children, every one of them who packed their bags and left, they all got to see God's power in a way that they had never imagined. They all got to experience God's love in a way that they never would have had they stayed in their chains of it is what it is. And so I'm asking you today, I've been asking myself today, What is my it is what it is, Egypt? What are my it is what it is chains that I've resigned myself to simply because I'm scared to death of getting hurt again. I'm afraid of being let down. I'm afraid that maybe that mountain won't move and then I'll have to try to explain to myself how I can believe in this God. And so I stay here. What is that? Well, what if today would be your day to say, you know what, in a new way, whether it's the first time or it's somewhere else in the journey with Jesus, you would say, you know what, today, Lord, here's my it is what it is. And I choose to trust you with that, leave it behind, let go of that, so I can have myself fully open to more of your power and love today. You know what would happen if we do that? (laughs) We find out that God's not been looking for superheroes. He's been looking for ordinary people like Moses and his brother Aaron and sister Miriam. He's been looking for ordinary people like you and me who in an extraordinary way embrace God's power and love so that not only we would experience his love and power, but people in this community and even beyond would see that it is what it is as a liar and our God still moves mountains. You all We're a part of that this past week, and I want you to be able to watch and see it. Thank you so much. I'm, I appreciate all of you. I really, 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 really,